Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Leah Gilmore. I am the um, First Service Music Director at Govins Presbyterian Church, and welcome to Music Mondays. Ooh, yeah, you hear the crowd? You hear the crowd doing their thing? We, we are so, so, so excited to have with us tonight uh, just an incredible gentleman who I know, we just realized that we this is the first time we actually see each other, but we've gone back and forth on all this music the wonderful music history stuff for a couple years now. Let me introduce you to Lamont Jack Pearlie, also known as Jack Dapper. <laughs> I'm, I'm everybody's applause, okay? Before, I, let me tell you a little bit about Music Monday. <laughs> music Monday is a music series that we do every week. Every week, my brothers and sisters, we present a musical artist or historian of some type and you are welcome to come here and listen to all of the great music every Monday. This is what we need on Monday evenings. Amen. 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 So Lamont is a New York City based, but now Kentucky based, descendant of the Great Migration. His life as a blues man changed dramatically in the mid 2000s when he returned to Louisiana and Mississippi to very close, very close relatives. Returning to these regions and their deep associations with blues history, he felt the urgency, urgency to raise cultural and ethnic awareness of African-American traditional music as it pertains to the black experience in America. He began using the methods of ethnography, genealogy, and archival research, in essence, the tools of the folklorist to more thoroughly trace his family's lineage. Inspired by his discoveries, he began interviewing people outside of his family who had similar stories, including African-American blues musicians who played various forms of traditional blues. Over the last 12 years, his work documenting African-American vernacular narratives, music, and cultures resulted in an extensive collection of field interviews with historians, documentarians, blues and folk musicians, and the children of Black music legends. This body of work has earned him an instructor induction into the New York Blues Hall of Fame. Wow. As great blues historian and TV producer and great blues artist for 2018, I introduce you everyone to Lamont Jack Pearlie. Thank you. Thank you. That's, that's uh, some hard shoes to fill, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> They're your shoes. You got to yeah, exactly, your own shoes. <laughs> exactly, the irony. <laughs> so I'm going to start with this one song uh, called uh, Grinning on Your Face by Sunhouse. I always start every uh, set or performance with this particular song for several reasons. I'll explain briefly after. Don't you mind people grinning. On your face, don't mind people grinning on your face. Bear this in mind, a good friend is hard to find. Don't you mind people grinning on their face. I say your mama will talk about you. Yeah, your sister and your brother too. Don't care how you live, they'll talk about still. Whoa, bear this in mind. A good friend is hard to find. Don't you mind people grinning on their face. Now, I always start with the, thank you. I always start with that song because one, it is the uh, almost quintessential version of a black spiritual, a Phil Holler, which is, explains so much of our traditional music. Also, it connects my family to the music through some house. And I'm gonna give you a quick ex explanation. In the blues and folk revival, the enthusiasts that were putting this together continued to tell how old they thought Sun House was. And Sun House continued to tell them how old he actually was. 
so he said he was a specific age, which would have made him 100 years old in 1988, right? So what I, what I figured was either they didn't know or he didn't know, which brings me to my family, because in that region, a lot of the people of that age group had no birth records. I remember when uh, my mother, my uncle, and my uh, aunt found out my granddaddy from Mississippi, his um, birth date. He was angry because he was 10 years older. <laughs> <laughs> so that's why I always sing that song as a homage. Now, this here also is a homage to Sun House, but it's my words because I've never picked cotton. My blues start on the concrete. So I'm a descendant. So this is one of the things I like to call New York blues. Morning in blues and blues, 
day the baby I can take them, can't shake them Low, get them off of me a quick moment to tell everybody that there is a way to support our artists tonight. Um, Maria will put into the chat the Venmo, PayPal, and Cash App um, alternatives for you to support Lamont and all of his incredible work. These are difficult times for artists out there, and we're just so grateful for everything you're bringing to us, Lamont, tonight. Thank you so much. And also, if you have a question, this guy knows a lot of stuff. If you have a question, just write your question in the chat and I'll ask it for you. All right, Lamont, back to you. Thank you very much. And you know, just on a side note, uh, majority of the songs that I write, because for me, the blues is man or woman talking to God about worldly situations. So it's not necessarily rescue me, but this is what's happening in this secular world. Help me. Right, so that's how I see the blues, which is why it's called for me, it's spiritual and spiritual blues. And this one here is based on uh, well, if the job don't pay, it's time to get going. <laughs> Start to believe that 
Satan's only here to deceive. I'd have prayed and the good Lord revealed to me that the Almighty won us as free as could be. If the job don't pay, then get gone, move on. Don't waste another day and get gone, move on. Why the hell you gonna stay and get gone, move on? Start your own business and get gone, move on. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> the level of authenticity is off the chart. Mm. Yes, it sounds like my uncle sitting on the um on their porch in North Carolina singing. But I understand your words though. That's the difference. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so Kelly Kelly wants to know with your songwriting, is it the lyrics first or the music? Is it the lyrics first or the what? Or the music. What comes first when you write a song? Or does uh, it come at the same time? Kelly, Kelly, Kelly. You know, for me, it's always been the lyrics. But when I um, evolved from rap to actually playing an instrument, it, it took, it, I couldn't write and then play initially. So I played and then what I felt just came out. But it's still lyric based, but it's really so. So in this space, I play, I play, and I, ooh, I got something. And then that's where we get to it. Yes. <laughs> I hope awesome. I answered the question. Awesome. So um, you're an ethnographer. I am. Yeah. So explain to us what ethnography is. So ethnography is the documenting. Uh, and, and the process of documenting uh, culture, folklore, um, tradition, heritage, and, and things of this nature. So uh, it's also equivalent to almost equivalent to anthropology. So you would you would look at someone like Zora Neale Hurston, uh, someone like uh, John Wesley Work, uh, someone like Alan Lomax. These were ethnographers and folklorists, and that's the space I'm in, yes. Mm -hmm. So you had a project with uh, Zora Neale Hurston, didn't you? I did. So we're going to show a little bit of that. Please do. How about that? Yes, indeed. Okay. So everyone be patient with me and my Zoom skills. I'm about to share something with you, all right? Okay. <laughs> Born on January 7, 1891, in Natasulga, Alabama, Zora Neale Hurston became the most successful and most significant black woman writer of the first half of the 20th century. Moving with her family to Eatonville, Florida, this rural community near Orlando was the nation's first incorporated black township. In Edenville, Zora was never indoctrinated in inferiority, and she could see the evidence of Black achievement all around her. Growing up in this culturally affirming setting in an eight-room house on five acres of land, Zora's father, John Hurston, formulated the laws that governed Edenville, and her mother, Lucy Potts Hurston, directed the Christian curriculum. Hurston's picturesque childhood would come to an abrupt end, when her mother died in 1904. Zora was only 13 years old. That hour began my wandering, she later wrote, not so much in geography, but in time. Then not so much in time as in spirit. After working a series of menial jobs, struggling to finish her schooling, and a stint with the Gilbert and Sullivan traveling troupe as a maid to the lead singer, in 1917, at the age of 26, she ended up in Baltimore. Still having the desire to finish high school, Zora presented herself as a teenager to qualify for free public schooling, giving her age as 16. 
studying anthropology at Bernard College and Columbia University and possessing a fiery intellect to accompany her bright eyes, big smile and passion for arts and culture, Zora used those talents plus dozens more to bulldoze her way into the Harlem Renaissance of the 1920s befriending such luminaries as poet Langston Hughes and popular singer-actress Ethel Waters. Though Hurston rarely drank, fellow writer Sterling Brown recalled, when Zora was there, she was the party. Zora traveled during the 1920s and 30s and primarily conducted fieldwork as an ethnologist and folklorist in African-American communities of the South and Caribbean where she collected the stories, music, and the oral poetry that filled the air of both work and leisure in everyday life. Here's an excerpt from one of her recordings with Alan Lomax. Here, as you hear it all over. The tune is consistent, but uh, they, they verses, you know, how things, every locality, you find some new verses everywhere. I mean, does it have the same chorus verses? I mean, does it have you on the map wherever you hear it? Well, there's some place I haven't heard that same verse, Mule on the Mound, but there's no place that I don't hear some of the same verses. Captain got a mule, mule on the mound, call him Jerry. <laughs> Captain got a mule, mule on the mound, call him Jerry. Gonna ride him down. Hurston had published several short stories, articles, a novel, and a well-received collection of Black Southern folklore, along with several plays and musicals, one written with the Harlem Renaissance legend Langston Hughes. Her folklorist work also include moments with Delta Blues great Gabriel Brown and Rochelle French. In 1945, having worry of possibly dying without money, Hurston wrote W.E.B. Du Bois in regards to a cemetery for the illustrious Negro dead on 100 acres of land in Florida with a persuasive argument. Let no Negro celebrity, no matter what financial condition they may be in in death, lie in inconspicuous forgetfulness. We must assume the responsibility of their graves being known and honored. Her argument unfortunately landed on deaf ears. Zora Neale Hurston died on January 28, 1960 at age 69 after suffering a stroke. Her neighbors in Fort Pierce, Florida had to take up a collection for her February 7th funeral. The collection didn't yield enough to pay for a headstone. Fortunately, a soon-to-be legendary African-American writer named Alice Walker, who was inspired by the life and works of Hurston, made her way through the thick and high grass covering Hurston's grave to place a headstone that read, Zora Neale Hurston, a genius of the South. Talking about the blues plays an important role in media and new media. Celebrating our heritage, preserving blues music, sharing artist journey, bringing diverse people together all in audio and video content. Hey guys. Okay. So, I you Thank you so that. much, Lamont. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right. So uh, let's get to it. Wait, hold on. All right. This is Open G. I like this tuning a lot. Get fretful. This is 
by um lamont i wrote that oh well even bigger <laughs> i wrote yes i wrote that wonderful uh, okay. this one is really a prayer is another original yes these are all originals okay wonderful mm -hmm.
Yes, I can feel that in my soul. Oh, Lord, help me. Yes, that's a cry that so many of us cry. And, um, you know, it's like you close your eyes and you can feel Robert Johnson and Sun House and all the early greats. So Laura wanted to know, this is a great question. She said that you mentioned that you rapped before did. you did this. So tell us more about, especially tell us how rap, it's not that dissimilar from blues and other African-American traditional music. Uh, rap is the only uh, contrast. Ironic that that question was asked to me because I'm currently uh, typing something about this. But the only real contrast between rap and the blues is the simple fact that the, the hip hop, because rap was always implemented in our traditional music if you think the dozens if you think uh folk narratives told by people like uh uh dolomite rudy ray moore that's that's rap hip-hop the difference between hip-hop and, and and our ancestral music is migration and industry so the the, the music be, just like chicago blues hip-hop began and it reflected uh, the urban environment, the concrete, the bricks. That's really the only contrast. I actually have a saying, I believe, and I have shirts that um, say it, hip hop is the great, great, great grandchild of the blues. They are very intertwined. Both of them uh, stems out of lack of resources. Uh, both of them are the response to blackness by a system that that oppresses uh that was that is unjust and 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 promotes poverty so they they're connected in many ways and um that's the, that was my era i mean initially i wanted to be david ruffins that didn't happen so you know hip hop was what was going on in, in my day uh even though i i heard these people and some of these people even friends of my grandparents on both sides cuz like i said they come out of louisiana mississippi um, separated by a stream, actually. Uh, but I, I didn't, I almost, I want to say I took advantage, not advantage to the uh, effect that it's utilized, but advantage to the fact that I, I, I didn't pay it super duper mind. It was just there. It was just what we did is what they did. They was in that room. We was in this room, you know, and, and when I came back, like Sister Leah said in my bio, when I came back from burying my father in Bell Rose, Louisiana, and my, my granddaddy on a, um, a military base, though all his family from Mississippi came up in Chicago and Detroit came up, it, it, it was a reawakening and, 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 uh, in, the, in the sense that I had to begin to trace. And as I was tracing, ancestors were telling me that, okay, we allowed you to do this, but now this is what you have to do. You, you have to take it to the root. And that's how I got here. But I, I rapped for a long time. Thank you, Lamont. Thanks. We're going to take a 10-second, well, maybe, maybe 25-second commercial break for Maria to tell us what's going on with uh, the folk life world. Unmute yourself, Maria. Okay. Now I'm unmuted, sorry about that. Tonight's performance is being recorded by Common Ground on the Hill as part of the work of the Maryland Folklife Center for the Maryland State Arts Council. The performance will be archived on the Common Ground on the Hill official YouTube channel where you can find other Govins Music Monday performances, as well as many other concerts, talks, and more. So please visit us there. Thank you, Leah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maria. And once again, everyone, you are watching, you are participating in Music Mondays at Govins Presbyterian Church 
in Baltimore, Maryland. My name is Leah Gilmore. I am the First Service Music Director, and as of January 4th, I will be the Minister of, um, oh my goodness, <laughs> the Minister of Racial Justice and Multicultural Engagement. I'm very happy and excited about this. Yay! <laughs> so everyone also, Govins is a very welcoming church. We pride ourselves on this. It's a welcoming and opening church. Anyone can attend this service. It is not, we are Christ-centered, but we are not, we don't think we have the answer to it all. So this is quite the place to be, and we're so glad you're with us tonight. And our pastor is online. Tom, do you want to say a couple things like hello or something? Hi, everybody. That's Tom Harris. <laughs> Thanks for being here. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Lamont, uh, for everything you're sharing with us tonight. It's amazing. Uh, the music you're sharing and the wisdom and inf information you're sharing. It's just amazing. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, we're just trying, at Govins, we're just trying to not be evil, um, which, you know, is a, a task in itself in the church these days. So um, if you'd like to help us with that, join us on Facebook <laughs> <laughs> or uh, or use the for the online form that I put in the... Um, in the chat box. Yes. I love that. We're just trying to not be evil. <laughs> Amen. And that's the truth right here. So Lamont, let's go on back to you. Th and there's a lot of thanks for your performance tonight. We're so, so, we have huge gratitude. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, it, were you asking any questions or? So even you, you talked about you know, how did you move from, was it really the visit to your family that let you move from doing rap to blues? I had a very similar awakening. I was a Prince fanatic, you know, during the 80s. And then I went down south to my family and I just got reintroduced to the music I had heard growing up anyway. And I wanted to make sure that African-American folk music was understood as the foundational music and so many other music genres. Tell us about your work and what you do. Well, I, I interview uh, a whole plethora of people to, um, the goal really for me is to present the proper context of the black or black American or African American and uh, uh, narrative on the Americas. So I, one of the things we do is um, I publish a newspaper. This is our second issue called African American Folklorist. Um, we, we, I interview a ton of people and I try to provide uh, as much uh, information as possible, but in the proper context, even going back to some of the old uh, ethno eth ethnographic works, not to debunk at all, but to, to look at it with one, fresh eyes, and two, uh, eyes of the people, right? Because a lot of things get uh, misconstrued. You know, a lot, of, uh, a lot of documents were taken in different uh, eras where different uh, ideologies and theologies were, were, were prevalent, were, were, were popular. So, you know, sometimes you don't get the full story. And then on the other side, I, you know, and uh, how can I say, I, I say it as a joke, but I, 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 don't, I, I don't know if the joke is tasteless, so I'm going to try to reword this a bit, but just the idea of the turn of the century from the late 1800s through the early 1900s for some of these uh, white anthropologists to go into the backwoods of the Black South where there was a lot of Black people who didn't want to go there and they were just able to get this information. It just doesn't add up to me, you know, in some cases. I, I think there's just so many things that was done. Some, some uh, folk gave information just for the sake of giving information and maybe getting a couple of dollars because you, it doesn't matter what your ethnicity is. If you go into a town that, or, or a community and start asking questions and, you know, people are going to be looking at you kind of crazy. So we, you know, we try to, to, to rummage through those things and, and, honor it and respect it, but at the same time, give it 
uh, fresh eyes in an in, in African American or black Indian context. And what do you mean by black Indian? Well, um, you know, my grandparents, I traced them back to the early 1800s, late 1700s, and the, the area of Mississippi they lived in was Indian territory. I have not been able to, at this point, to trace them back to Africa. Um, there, there are, you know, there's black Indians. You know, the, some of the research I've done led me to find out and see there are words that are used. Some blatantly say black, some say swarthy, tordy, or tardy, something like this, mahogany colored, uh, copper colored. They were describing uh, brown hued, dark brown hued people when they arrived here. And these were uh, indigenous Native Americans. Um, so, the, you know, I don't mean the, the, the black Indian culture of uh, that celebrated in in New Orleans for for the Mardi Gras. I mean, actual tribes like the Creek, the Choctaw, the 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 uh, Tecumcha, the the Seminole, and things of this nature. There's much more, but these are just some I could call off the top of my head. Ah, uh, thank you. So, what are you gonna play for us next, Lamont? Tell us all about it. That's not for every, you know, that's not everybody's story, but that's just part of it. I don't know. I think, you know what? Let's see. There was a question about that guitar of yours, that national. You, you got a story? The what's the question? When did you get it? Maybe a month ago. I'm still getting used to it. It's beautiful. It is. It's right pretty. Does she have a name? Yes. Uh, Black Nisi slash Pretty Nisi 2. All right. <laughs> the number two. Yeah. The Pretty Nisi ones over there and the original Pretty Nisi you met earlier. The missus. I, I named my guitar after my wife. <laughs> No enemy load except the man with a wicked intent. I ain't got no enemy load except the man with a wicked intent. Satan lurking, lurking around my door. Christ protecting my home. I ain't got no enemy load except the man with a wicked intent. I ain't got no enemy load except the man with a wicked intent. Knocking, knocking at my door. My children playing, playing on the floor. I ain't got no enemy load, except the man with wicked intent. Got no enemy load, except the man with wicked intent. Police knocking, knocking at my door. My wife is patient, 
Powerful lyrics. Um, everyone's talking about your amazing lyrics right now. I, I ain't got no, but the, I ain't got no enemies, Lord, except the man with the wicked intent. Yes, ma'am. Amen. A, now, on the true story. Oof, let me tell you, um, that kind of touches so many of us so deeply in so many spaces. Uh, let's see. Pastor Tom says something very powerful. I want to take an opportunity to read it. He says, so much of modern Christian music is praise music, praise music. It focuses on the greatness and wonder and power of God. Yet blues often feels more spiritual or to have more depth because it focuses on basic human struggles. Or to have, it almost seems like singing blues is more authentically praising God's greatness without even naming God by expressing human struggle and longing. What we are lacking how we are incomplete. That's very powerful and very straight on. Go ahead, preach, Pastor Tom. Yes, indeed. I couldn't say no better than that. That's right. That's right. And it's so true. And so much of what we know, gospel actually developed from the blues. Yes, Most of us on this on here knows that. But um, that's something, gospel did not come first. Blues was first. And then later became gospel with a wonderfully compelling story behind that. Uh, Walt Michael, who is the executive director of Common Ground on the Hill, who, who, who what, what we're recording for with the folk life, wants to know, have you met my friend Guy Davis? Mr. Guy Davis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a funny story behind We love Guy. 
there's a funny story behind this. Um, this gentleman uh, produced a lead belly fest at, um, I'm from New York and I can't even remember the name of this place. Uh, I, I just know it was on 50 something, some big hall. And he invited me there and Dom Flemings was there. And oh, yes. So me, Dom, my wife, his wife, and we, we, you know, we work in the room and he introduces me to this gentleman and I, I, I didn't know who it was. And the guy comes over and says, hey, man, and he chats me up and he says he wants to be on my show and be interviewed. And I was like, cool, man, I saw you up there. You reminded me of uh, uh, Brownie McGee. And he just looked at me, he laughed. He said, okay, all right, I'll, I'll give you a call. So he calls me and we're talking and talking and setting up this interview and talking about that I believe he reminds me of Brian McGee, but Sonny Terry was actually his favorite. And that's when I realized, well, not that moment, but later in the conversation and after we hang up and schedule meeting together and do, doing a, uh, producing a, a, a video interview with him, I realized I was talking to Guy Davis. Right. <laughs> the legacy yes. of Ruby D and Ozzy Davis. That's right. The star of of um wild was it wild style? No, it wasn't wild style. It was the uh the, the You mean the rap Beach movie, Street. the hip hop movie Beach Street? Beach yeah. Street. yeah. Right. So I, I didn't realize this until and so when I went to to meet him. And, he, and I'm just looking at him. He said, hey, man, everybody's going, what's wrong? I said, well, why you didn't tell me? And he laughed. I had no, I, I didn't put two and two together. He's a great, great gentleman, wealth of knowledge, and a phenomenal guitarist on many mm -hmm. levels. Yes, I, I, he's, I, he's I have. The, you're right. I mean, but you guys both share that same spirit, that the music is so much more important than, than the self. I mean, you express yourself through the music. So, yes, I, that's an awesome story. And Guy is like that. I mean, Guy is one of the reasons I sing the blues. I mean, very humble nice. spirit. But this is a guy who was playing on the floor as his father was writing Malcolm X's eulogy. Imagine that. Just imagine that. But we're going to have to get Guy for Music Monday, Miss Maria. Yes, we will. It's going to happen. I'm telling you now. Hold on, folks. So, Lamont, we have time for one more. One more song? Sure. One more song. Oh, you know what? Is your family coming? That's what I was about to do because I had another song, but let, mm -hmm. let me pause them and see if they're ready. All right. So while we're waiting for Lamont to rustle up his folks, um, next week will for Music Monday will be Jesse Paladowski. And who is Jesse Pal? He's an amazing guy. He wrote the most recent with over 400,000 views, the updated version of American, the America the Beautiful 2020. It's an incredible version, so powerful. So make sure you make plans to come next week. Join our mailing list. I will put my email into the chat. That way you can join our mailing list if you're not on it. And I promise you, I get too many emails, my brothers and sisters. I'm not going to send you a lot of emails, okay? I promise you. All right. So Lamont, are we almost ready? Yes, we're about ready now. So I want to thank Kelly and Joe and Fred and Pastor Tom and Jane and Sandra Brown. Hey, girl. And Hugh and Betsy and my girl, Susan and Laura. Hey, Laura and Ben and Walt and Tim and Nikki and Shelly and Andy and Deborah and Pat and Deb and Bonnie and all of you for just spending this evening with us. Wasn't this great? Yeah. I loved it so much. I think we really thank Lamont so much. His family's coming in and we're about to do our thing. I'm going to turn it over. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hey, y'all. Okay, so this is our family song. We wrote this together. Uh, it's, it's a call response, black spiritual prison song, work song. If, if, call and response the whole thing. Y'all ready? Mm -hmm. All right. I've been down I've been Whoa, I've been down Whoa, I've been Yeah, I've been down Whoa, I've been down Oh, I've 
Amen. Thank you, Denise, and your beautiful kids. Thank you so much. What are, What are your kids' names? Um. Well, I'm Lamont Junior. I'm Samara. Samara. Yes. Beautiful. Samara. And Lamont Junior. All right, y'all sang that song. All right, <laughs> you took it to church. All right, now praise God. Hey, thank Lamont. Let's take a moment, everyone on the Zoom call. Take a moment to unmute. And just say thank you tonight. All right. Thank you. 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 So great. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. We really yeah. enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Once again, please take a moment to support Lamont and his family. The tip jar information will be in the chat once again. This was an amazing evening, Lamont. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all of the work you do to keep us honest, to keep the history going, to keep the authentic authenticity of who we are as a, and the importance of our culture on the entire cultures of, our, of the world. So thank you. And thank you, Denise, for all the work you do. I hear you're good at that tech girl. Huh? You're a good technology person, right? I try. I try. Yeah, I know. You're not just trying. Those videos are good. <laughs> It's such a blessing when the entire family does it, you know, and does all these things together. Yes. So everyone, you have a wonderful evening. These, I just want to say these two little Please. people, young people, I'm sorry, they write for the newspaper because we have a section oh, called African-American Folklorist Kids. Mm -hmm. along with Tell us some more about the newspaper before we go. Um, so the African-American Folklorist is, is articles... Uh, essays, dissertations, and interviews grounded in ethnography, folklore, tradition, heritage, music, or a uh, uh, religion, uh, uh, spiritual beliefs, and everything, and how it moves across the region, the vernaculars of the region, the whole spill. We 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 look to give the story of the blues people in here. Amen. Thank you so much again. Thank you so much for all of the work that you're doing. Thank and you. for your music, for music, I will not forget that one song for a long time, you know. I, so, I just hope I did it justice. Thank you. You did it justice. You did it justice. <laughs> Thank you, everybody.